When you think of Boston battlegrounds, you probably think of Bunker Hill. But when war came to this city, it was won or lost in the harbor. Boston has been a major American city for over 200 years. It's grown and prospered for plenty of reasons. But one of them is out there, Boston Harbor. There's one island out there that defended this city from attack nonstop for centuries. Located at the mouth of the harbor, Long Island has been a top secret military location from the Revolutionary War, when George Washington put cannons here to drive away the British fleet, to World War II, when it was used to hide a defecting Nazi scientist who changed the course of history. And on its eastern tip is a cutting edge fortress built in the late 1800s to withstand the horrors of modern military technology, Fort Strong. I'm heading out there to see one of the main reasons why enemy invaders have steered clear of this harbor for centuries. It's just a short drive from downtown via a causeway and a 3,000 foot bridge. But you can't get anywhere near the fort without special permission from the city. The island is government property, and without Boston Police Sergeant Bob Gillooly, we'd be locked out. But up until the 1940s, guarding the fort was a matter of national security. So Boston has been using this, this site for military use for 200 or plus years. At least, years. yes. Anything that's coming out of the, the harbor has to sail directly past here. Right. Within, within a couple hundred yards. Okay. Two miles from town, there's something completely forgotten. It's like a movie set, isn't it? Yeah, pretty impressive the first time you see it. This hulking concrete fort built up in the 1890s was part of a radically reimagined approach to coastal defense. 70 fortresses like this lining the coast that cost over $10 million and were designed to hold off the most fearsome weapon the world had ever known. Fleets of ironclad ships with long range guns. Germany, Russia, and Japan all had them and there was no guarantee they wouldn't be unleashed on the US. They had to create deterrence. This is no different than a nuclear arsenal, this right? Was, this was high tech of its time. We're climbing up to the top of a structure that's mostly hidden below ground. There's a whole series of gun placements. OK. What does this say? Well, I think uh, Kennedy. if you look at it, it's Kennedy. It's uh, <laughs> from the 1959 campaign for Jack. No kidding. And strangely enough, it keeps getting uh, fixed occasionally. Oh, it's Boston. Come yeah, on. There you go. <laughs> you watch out for your own? <laughs> Absolutely. And this is the battery for, oh, I see. So these huge gun placements. Yeah, they're massive. I mean, we take for granted no one ever attacked America. Well, there was sort of a reason for that, wasn't there? It was Fortress America. Yeah, exactly. And you're standing on it. So I can get down inside there? Yeah, you can go down one of these ladders. Yeah. And then you can go into the, into the fort itself. Oh, wow. Look at this. OK, so you get a sense of how big this artillery really was. You can imagine a gigantic, probably 16-inch gun eventually, sits right in this area here. You look over here. This is the lookout for the personnel who are aiming these guns out here. And it would go up, shoot, and then come back down here. And it lowered down, basically taking itself out of harm's way. Capable of firing a shell over seven miles, the strength of this gun's recoil actually reset the mechanism, raising a pile of lead weights to the surface. When the lever was thrown, the weights fell, and the gun popped back up, ready for action. All the supply and things were coming down from below here. So this is the circular structure below the placement above us. It's not exactly in the best of condition. Look at that. I wonder if I should just slide down in there. Let's see if we can get down in here. I don't want to fall and kill myself here. Here it goes. Oh. A lot of ways to hurt yourself down here. When the fort's giant batteries went online in 1899, this room was packed with deadly ammunition for the guns above. The rails and hoists that move the shells are gone picked clean by metal salvagers. But the bones of the fort's structural defenses are still strong. Look at this. There's some, uh, some old uh, 
graffiti from World War II. Home was never like this. <laughs> December 8th, 1941, Brooklyn, New York. Jeez, this would have been the day after Pearl Harbor. 12 8 41. That's amazing. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, both coasts went on high alert. Here at Fort Strong, anti aircraft batteries were set up. The fort, once a cutting edge deterrent, was now dangerously vulnerable to aircraft. But it still had a huge role to serve when it was needed the most. In 1945, the Army needed to smuggle a precious asset into the U.S., one that would launch the U.S. into the space age, a Nazi scientist named Werner von Braun. Braun had developed the V-2, a long-range death-dealing rocket, the forerunner to today's ICBMs. When he surrendered to the U.S., he was brought here to Fort Strong to begin top secret research that eventually led to our space program. Without Von Braun's help on the Saturn V rocket, we might never have gotten to the moon. His work also propelled us into the nuclear arms race. In an age of long range bombers and nuclear missiles, Fort Strong's state of the art defenses were now antique, and it was shut down for good in 1946. There you go. This is a. Uh a collapse caused by Mother Nature and, uh, and time. You know, the bombs and the shells never came, but time is taking its toll on this place. Fort Strong is not so different from the abandoned nuclear silos that riddle our landscape today. The fact that no enemy ever dared to open fire here is proof of its success. Protected by the best, most innovative tech of its time, Boston kept growing. But as we'll see next, there's always a price for progress, even if most of the evidence has been washed away. You don't get a city as big and bustling as 21st century Boston without serious growing pains. And one of the city's colossal engineering projects called for a major sacrifice, only it was from people who didn't even live in Boston. By the 1920s, this city was urgently seeking a vast new supply of drinking water for its burgeoning masses. But this wouldn't be easy. And just as with dozens of huge public works projects around the country, providing for the good of many would mean that an unlucky few would have to give up, well, everything. This city's been building reservoirs and aqueducts since the 1800s. But as the population tripled between the late 1800s and the 1920s, they weren't enough. The city was one drought away from disaster. So Boston planned to dam the Swift River and transform an entire valley into a reservoir, creating the largest body of water in the state. But to get it, they had to erase the whole way of life to the 2,500 people living in the flood zone. About an hour and a half west of Boston, this is where the drinking water comes from, the Quabbin Reservoir. Look at this place, unbelievable. I mean, back in the 30s, this wasn't even here, right? This is a, a valley with houses and people and roads and everything all down where the water is today. There are no traces left of that small town life. The only thing that did survive the 400 billion gallon deluge was a decadent hangout for well-to-do outsiders. And reservoir coordinator Cliff Reed is going to get me into areas off limits to the public to see it. Everything was removed when they built the reservoir, so there are no houses remaining. But it's the place where 2,500 people lived. The towns here, Greenwich, Prescott, Dana, and Enfield, had roots that stretched back from colonial times. And they didn't die without a fight. Court battles lasted for years as these farmers and merchants tried to hold onto their homes and hold off Boston's thirsty hordes. But eminent domain eventually forced the last locals out of the valley in 1937. And then the wrecking crews moved in. Called the woodpeckers, the tough big city work gangs demolished every building, chopped down every tree, and burned what was left. They even dug up the graveyards, moving 6,500 coffins and headstones to a new cemetery outside the flood zone. The only thing they didn't erase were the roads. This kind of brings it all home, doesn't it? Right past this barrier, you're on the original road. This asphalt road just continues right into the water. They did not remove that. If I felt like getting wet, I could walk right into the town, or what was the town of Enfield. 
You see this little island out there? That was not an island back in the 30s, okay? That would have been just a hillside next to the road. High on a former hilltop stands the only structure that survived the devastation, only spared because it was above the waterline. This area is all a restricted area. Come on, Dave Scottie. Nice Welcome to meet aboard. You. Thank you very much. We're heading to a part of the reservoir where boating is absolutely prohibited to the public. Areas uninhabited and untouched for over 70 years. And we're closing in on the only evidence that humans were ever here. It's a golf course clubhouse built for wealthy out-of-towners. So that's the country club. That's correct. That's the stairway going up to the country club. Dave, how are you going to do this? We don't have a dock. I'm just going to put it neutral <laughs> and let the wind gently push us in. Oh, that is daring boatmanship. There we go. Land ho. Looks like it was a nice building, wasn't it? Yes. I got to remind myself, we're not on an island in those days. That's yeah. when it was just the land. Somebody could drive right up to it. It's a pretty impressive ruin, isn't it? Cute. Look at that fireplace. That's huge. Back in 1928, when this place was open for business, the clubhouse overlooked a nine-hole golf course with putting greens made from imported German grass. It was the brainchild of two ambitious businessmen from Springfield, John Duggan and Thomas Mahar. They made a tidy profit catering to golfers with money to burn, and rumor has it, supplying stiff drinks to bigwigs during Prohibition. But the club they called Dugmar was just part of a much grander scheme to cash in on the tragedy looming over the farmers in the valley below. They knew full well that there was going to be a reservoir built here. No kidding. So this so, is a real estate speculation. Yes, they bought it for about $6,800. And then they ended up settling finally with the state around uh, $150,000. Which in the 20s or in the 30s was a lot more money. than Yes, it was. The club owners were paid 10 times more per acre than the townspeople because of the improvements they made here. What do you think? This is maybe a kitchen back here? It's a forest now, but it looks like it had some sort of utility here. Look, old tile. tile, yes. Tile kitchen floor, I bet. And there's the chimney over there. You can see what this place looks like. Here, this is the floor level right here coming out. I'm standing beneath, beneath the floor, very posh, two, two fireplaces within 25 feet of each other. With a little imagination, you can see the big shots having a drink up here at the 19th hole, while fear and frustration grew in the valley as the clock counted down to doomsday. It was curious to be at a place that, uh, you know, is the last thing standing in what once were full-on towns. Those towns are nearly forgotten today, but every drop of drinking water in Boston is their memorial and a reminder of the costly price of progress.